All right, why don't we go ahead and get started here. I am thrilled to have uh, Brenna Galvin here. She is a shareholder, an elder law attorney from Maser Amundsen Boggio and Associates. Maser Amundsen has been a longtime exhibitor of our conference, maybe from the very beginning. Uh, Chris Maser herself has given multiple presentations for us, as have other of the attorneys from uh, the Maser and Associates. So we are thrilled to have Brenna Galvin here with us. Her talk is going to be uh, on uh, really tools to help you and your loved ones with memory loss prepare and plan from a legal and financial standpoint as well. So Brenna, please, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so honored to be here with you this morning. I'm hoping today that we can tackle multiple issues in the short amount of time. Make sure you have kind of the groundwork that you need to feel empowered as caregivers and care receivers from a legal perspective as well as organizationally and financially as we kind of embark on your what's next. So we're going to go over some practical tools as well as legal tools that all of you should build in your toolkit. And I also want to be sure that you leave today identifying some payor sources or resources that can help you fund chronic care needs. There's a lot of confusion about that and I hear often that um, individuals come into my office and they say, you know, Joe down the street told me I should maybe transfer my house to my kids. And there's big ramifications for these decisions. So we wanna be sure that you know what the correct information is and you can determine what's best for you and your family. And then, you know, one of my big philosophies is that none of us should go alone, right? And through all of this, we're stronger when we work together. So how do we build a team around us that we can rely on and utilize to make sure that we have all the resources surrounding us as we, as we move forward? So I'll identify some players that you might want to access as part of your team. You know, one of my favorite quotes that I've ever seen has been Rosalind Carter's, there are four types of people in this world. Those who are caregivers, those who have been caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So all of us are going to fall into one of these buckets at some point in our lives, maybe multiple. And so we need to be sure that um, since it's it's a guarantee, it's to, we need to plan for it. Often pe people think that when they utilize an elder law attorney or an estate planning attorney, they're really planning for where money passes when they die. And it, I'm less concerned, that's an important consideration, we wanna plan for that, but I wanna move forward or backwards in the timeline and think about how you live when you're alive. How do we give you the legal tools you need to live well while you're here and that for your caregivers or loved ones to also support you in that journey? Uh, so planning should contain disability planning. What happens when we're alive but incapacitated? So the other thing to keep in mind is that legal documents are a wonderful tool, they're necessary, but it's really important for us to have talks and discussions with our loved ones so they know how to use them and they know what your wishes are and they can help you surround your, you and your team and say, this is what your values are, this is what our plan is and how can we work together to support you. So there are some priorities you should kind of think about when you're planning. I would say priority number one is make decisions early and this is a hard thing to do. People want to put this off until the last minute or they're thinking, well, do we really need to go through all this work? I can tell you that when we plan early, we have far more options available and a lot easier options available than when we are in crisis. I, I tell people all the time, crisis planning is not planning. We still have options and we still have things that we can do, but the landscape is much smaller than if we do so ahead of time. And then create your team. You'll hear this over and over again. Build that resource center of professionals and loved ones around you that you can lean on. And kind of my motto with all of my clients is, we want to plan for the worst so you can live your best. 
we talk a lot about the what if scenarios. At what point could we potentially need outside caregivers to come in? At what point won't living at home be sustainable? At what point do you think that um, your income won't be enough to sustain your care needs. Those, those discussions are hard to have, but we want to do so so we can be sure that we line everything up and you have anything um, or everything that you could need. So the first thing I want to talk to you about today is a health care directive. How many of you have health care directives? Show of hands. Oh, this makes me proud. My heart just grew two sizes like the Grinch. <laughs> <laughs> healthcare directives are a wonderful resource. And the best thing to my clients about healthcare directives are, even though it's a legal tool, you don't need a lawyer to do it, right? So it's important to get it done. And I always think about how Prince was known as many different names over the years. So the healthcare directives have taken different names over the years as well. They were called advanced directives or are, they're called living wills or durable powers of attorney for healthcare. Since 2008, the state of Minnesota has a form and has encompassed all of the powers, not only the appointment of a legal agent, but also what your wishes are regarding end of life, all in one document, a healthcare directive. So if you still have something that's called a living will or a durable power of attorney for healthcare, that to me shows that you haven't looked at this since 2008. It's been 11 years. Time to update, okay? So uh, these, what we'll discuss today is that documents shouldn't be stagnant. Often we finish these documents and we put them on our shelf and we're like, oh good, we're done thinking about this, right? Let's move on to the next thing. But you should be reviewing these regularly and making sure that as your life changes, as your care prognosis changes, as your needs change, these documents change to reflect that. So, there are a few major players in a healthcare directive. They're the person filling it out, that's the principal. They're the person that they appoint, the agent, the legal healthcare agent, and then there are successors to that agent. And you can have one agent, you can have multiple. But I, what I want you to think about when we designate an agent are time, talents, and treasures, right? So I uh, go back to that old adage and think to myself, is the person that I'm appointing the best person for the job? Because it's the most important decision you can make when you're filling out your directive. This person has the authority to interpret what you've put down on the document, correspond with your doctors and providers, your care team, and make treatment-related decisions on your behalf. So we want to be sure that this person has um, a sense of who we are, what our values are, what our wishes are, and also have, has the ability to do that. Sometimes my clients say to me, well, I'm just going to appoint my oldest child and we're going to go in pecking order from oldest to youngest because I don't want anyone's feathers to get ruffled, right? I don't want them to feel bad that I didn't select them. I see some head nods. So you might have thought the same thing when you were filling out yours. But it's really important to think, does this person have the ability to do the job we're asking them to do? And it's a hard job, right? It's not normal for us when we're a child or a spouse to take off the cap of being that, that child or spouse and say, now I'm going to be my parent or my loved one, and I'm going to make whatever decision they would make. I, my relationship doesn't shouldn't impact that. I shouldn't think about what I want. I should only be thinking about what they want. That's not very natural, right? We don't often have to take off these hats. We are usually wearing all of them at the same time. Um, a friend of mine and a colleague, Deborah Laxon, wrote a book about this because she experienced that when she was caregiving for her loved one. She said, it was very hard for me to realize we were four days into ICU and I was still wearing my caregiver cap and my spouse cap. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that now I'm the agent. I'm the healthcare agent. And we're doing care treatment that we had discussed wasn't really wanted or needed. Okay, so I want you to think long and hard. If that's the only thing you put in your directive, who your agent is, 
that's, you should make sure that that's really well thought of and you've talked to that person about the job you're asking them to do. Now, there's lots of different forms for a healthcare directive. So don't, you shouldn't worry, do I have a right one or a wrong one? It's just whether it's done and it's right for you. Okay, so you can have, there's a five wishes document that's available online. The University of Minnesota Extension Program has its own version as well. Honoring Choices of Minnesota has a form that's widely accessible. And often healthcare providers, if you're a veteran, the VA has a form that you can utilize. Um, sometimes your Alina healthcare system or whatever Fairview that you're working with, they might have their own as well. So don't worry so much about picking the best form. Worry a lot about what, who you're designating, the wishes or values you have regarding care and end of life treatment and sharing those wishes finalizing the document and sharing those with your loved ones. So why, why do a healthcare directive? So a healthcare directive really is there so if you can't speak for yourself, someone else can step in. And that someone else is a person that you've designated. So to me, that really protects your autonomy. If you're a care receiver or a caregiver, and you have a say in who the decision maker is when you can't speak for yourself, you get to maintain some control, even if mentally you're unable to continue um, in the same fashion you've been doing before. So that's very powerful. And we need a legal decision maker. Healthcare providers need that decision maker. Your loved ones need to know who is the person we can look to to make this call. And that helps reduce friction in the family. It helps reduce um, time and expense from a care uh, provider standpoint as well. And then we want it to serve as a guide for care providers. Um, I've, I've said a lot about this already, but not only does a healthcare directive designate an agent, but it also gives the directions to them for decision making. And you can include in this document a release for medical records. And this, I've seen, is very important for providers. So the document can authorize within it that an agent has the authority to look at through your medical history and records because the person you've appointed probably has not gone to every appointment along the way. They might not know the full history of your diagnosis, prognosis, who your providers have been, what's been discussed from course of treatment. So we want that release or authorization to release medical records to them. You can designate in that document to a guardian. And we'll talk a little bit more about guardianship because I think that that's a term that there's some, a legal term that there's some confusion. And you can give the agent the ability to authorize intrusive mental health treatment. And it, that's important from, for this group too because often there are prescriptions that include neuroleptic medication or extreme um, antipsychotics, even with dementia and Alzheimer's. And so as a result, we want to be sure your agent has the ability to say yes to that course of treatment or no, okay? You can also designate what happens with your actual physical body when you die. So where do you want to donate organs? Do you prefer cremation or burial? Do you have a plot or a spot picked out for your final resting place? These are things that you can communicate to your loved ones so they know that you've thought through this in advance. Um, so really any direction. Some people even include things like, you know, what really makes me happy in life is when my loved ones are around me or we're sharing music or songs or maybe we're playing my favorite record. You can give those what I call, those aren't really um, medical treatments, right? Those are, I'd say, soft treatments that improve our quality of life but would be important for your loved ones to know you'd like. But again, if all you can do is designate an agent, that's the thing to do, okay? So what happens for those of you who don't have a healthcare directive? What would happen if you could no longer make your own healthcare choices? 
At that point, we would have no real clear path. Do we continue treatment or do we stop it? I'll tell you that there's a default in medicine that we're going to treat, right? We're going to keep you alive for as long as possible. That's been kind of in Western medicine, the default, all right? That doesn't always take into account quality, right? That's more focused on quantity of days than it is quality of life. So we want to be sure that if your wish does not follow that default treatment, we've given your providers and loved ones guidance on it. And if you don't have a directive, we also could need a guardianship proceeding. And what a guardianship is, is that if you don't have a legal agent, your loved ones or a professional would petition the court and say, this person no longer has capacity. We don't have a directive or something in place designating a legal agent, and we need someone to do decisions related to end of life care or just where someone lives or resides. Um, so a guardian's needed at that time. Now, I tell my clients that we wanna avoid guardianship at, at all costs if possible, because guardianship is a court, um, a court order or a court supervised process. So when we petition here in Hennepin County, if I petitioned Hennepin Co County for guardianship today, it's likely I'm not going to get in front of a judge on that proceeding for eight weeks, two months. So in the interim, again, your providers are doing default treatment. The family is in limbo. They don't know who can make a call. They don't know if they can place you in the care setting that's best for you. So we want to avoid the time, the expense, and the heartache of going through that process. And to me, most judges are not going to know you personally, right? They're not going to know anything about your family or situation or your wishes. All they're going to have is the information we submit on a form to them about why we think this is necessary. And then they make the call about what they think is best. So I want to keep people who don't know you and your loved ones out of that decision-making process if possible. It's a, it is a tool we can use if there's not another choice, but if somebody still has the ability to sign a document or understand who they're appointing or that they want to appoint their loved one, we're going to seek what I call a lesser restrictive alternative, right? We're gonna go find, um, to complete a healthcare directive and appoint an agent rather than go through the court process. So sometimes when we talk about who an agent can be, people wonder, does it have to be a professional? Can it be a loved one or should it be a loved one? Um, Sometimes your spouse isn't the best person to make that call, right? So we have to think really long and hard about who the decision maker will be for you. And again, are they willing and able to do it? So I think good agents, good <laughs> agents, are those who clearly know you and understand your values and accept them, okay? So I have had kids say, no, I, I know that they've told me they don't want treatment, but I can't accept that. I'm not ready. Okay, so if that person is giving you any signs of that, we don't want them serving in that role because they might be, know you, but they are not accepting your, your wishes and values. And they should be unafraid to kind of talk to medical professionals. If your agent hates hospitals, and they hate talking to doctors or nurses or care providers, is this person going to be able to do what we're asking them to? And I think that they should be assertive on your behalf if your wishes aren't being followed by the professionals. It helps if they're a good communicator. It's not necessary, but it helps the family to know, okay, we can talk to this person and they can tell us what's going on and give us a rundown. So I think it's helpful if they have strong communication skills with your family. 
The next document I want you to have in your toolkit, so we've got healthcare directives there. I also want you to consider whether a POLST is necessary, and a POLST is an acronym. It's an acronym for Providers Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. A POLST is a medical document. It's a doctor's order. It's not a legal document. You can't go to your lawyer to do it. You have to see your primary care physician or a care provider. And really, this document's focused on end-of-life care. Usually, it's used for people who have a terminal illness or who are medically fragile, okay? This really talks about do you or do not you not want CPR, intubation, artificial nutrition, and hydration? The form looks like this. It's kind of hard to see on your small um, printout, but if you look up on the screen here, you'll see kind of a one-page form, uh, the front side of it that you can do with your doctor. Now, it'll outline whether you do or do not want it or whether it's a maybe or it depends. Okay. Now, the nice thing about having this document is that emergency medical professionals, such as firefighters, police officers, um, EMTs, they can recognize this and follow your wishes that are outlined. Okay. So people say, well, I said in my healthcare directive already, right, that I don't want any of this treatment. But, you know, I know somebody who got resuscitated at the facility down the hall from me, okay? This is a document that emergency professionals can follow. There's, again, a default that if an EMT finds you on the ground, not breathing, they're going to try and resuscitate you and get you to the closest um, medical provider for further care and evaluation. That's just what a standing doctor's order to them says. So we need a different doctor's order if we want something else, okay? So we've talked about kind of end of life wishes, but I wanna talk to you a little bit about having the talk with your loved ones. This is a hard conversation for some people to have, and we're very Minnesotan, I've found, with my clients, right? We're, we don't like to talk a lot about this, especially not over dinner or at a holiday, but um, <laughs> I think it's really important for us to try to have these discussions. And I, I want you to have a few tools for how to broach the topic. Okay, so I think about when I'm having a hard topic, sometimes I look at popular culture or media. So I think it's been two years ago now where Barbara Bush said, you know, I'm going to start, I'm going to stop ongoing treatment and I've elected hospice care. And that made national news. And a lot of people used that then to have a conversation with their loved ones about, you know, if they were in a similar place, would they stop treatment or do they have a preference for hospice or palliative care, comfort care only? They, you can use these topics to start a conversation and just say, you know, I've thought about what I want for myself. Have you thought about what you want? I want to be sure you know this. Sometimes I've got our kind of um, four square logo because sometimes people want me to start the conversation with their loved ones. They say, you talk about end of life all the time. You can tackle this. We're going to bring the kids in and you can lay it on them, right? So you can use professionals to do this conversation too, right? But I, I've also found some fun tools, fun. Uh, you have to understand that an elder law attorney's definition of fun is different than the most of the population, <laughs> okay? So there is an online tool called the Conversation Project, and the Conversation Project gives you a series of kind of questions or conversation starters or options, and you can go through them with your loved ones and interact on these topics. And it's a great external source that gives you a guide. You don't have to create one for yourself. And you can utilize that and access it for free. Okay? The other thing, it's um, available online for free, but you can order the physical cards, is a card game called Go Wish. 
All right, they've made a card game out of this. They're, I'm not the only one who has this fun <laughs> definition, right? So go wish is similar to go fish, right? And you lay out your cards and you organize them. And you say, you know, to me, maybe financial is a big value. If my care costs were making my loved ones not be able to feel safe and secure, I would not want ongoing treatment. Where somebody might say, you know, I love interacting in nature, and if it looks like you can take me outside and I can sit in a sunbeam, that, that's really high quality of life. And I love sharing this story. I had a client once who said, Brenna, as long as I can eat a bowl of ice cream and I look happy doing it, keep me going. <laughs> I was like, I, I feel you, Bill, you know? <laughs> Like, so I, there are different values on this. And what you'll find when you have this physical card and you organize them, you can look at your, your partners or your other player and say, gosh, I didn't organize mine like that at all. And start having a conversation about why. These are just a little tips and tricks for how to have the talk. We have an awkward conversation with our kids as they're growing up in adolescence, right? How to be safe, how to be careful, right? We need to talk about with our adult children, our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends, what our wishes are and why, okay? This is how we, we start making sure that our values are followed even when we can't speak for ourselves. So I want to kind of switch gears. We've talked a lot about care, and I want to lead you towards um, powers of attorney, so financial documents. And these financial documents would be um, powers of attorney that cover who handles financial transactions for you if you can't anymore, okay? Who has the ability to sign checks, talk to your financial advisor, submit a tax return. Who can take care of these really practical needs as we, as we age, as we interact with different diagnoses? Okay, we need a document that authorizes this. Now, some of you, and there might be a card that gets passed around with this question, but some of you might say, you know, Brenna, I don't need a power of attorney. I've just added my loved one to my checking account, and it's all going to be fine. And I say, no, no, it's not, that's not enough, because most of us don't have the entirety of our financial transactions happening in and out of one account, right? If something happens and your pension doesn't come in one month, if just because the joint account holder is on the account doesn't mean that that joint account holder can call your pension provider and say, what happened? We noticed we missed a check. Is something going on? Do we need to file a paper that you know, we missed in the mail? They don't have that ability unless you have a power of attorney, okay? So we want something that's broad and encompassing that'll be able to handle anything that could come up, not just the, the payment or pay, um, check writing ability for one account. We want something holistic, the whole picture, okay? So we wanna grant someone that we trust, right? Some, this is a big power. We want somebody that we trust to be appointed as your what's called attorney in fact. This person can step in your shoes for financial decision making. And this is typically we sign it so it's valid when you sign it and it stays valid through your death. So it's durable. Sometimes people say, Brent, I need one of those durable powers of attorney, right? We don't want it to be temporary. We need it to last the whole time we're around, okay? So one example of these powers of attorney is a Minnesota statutory short form power of attorney. This comes straight from Minnesota law so often financial institutions can recognize it. It allows us to appoint one person or multiple people to act on our behalf. Let me tell you, if you have two kids who don't get along, we need to think really hard about whether, it's, whether they should be appointed together, okay? Often what I'm doing is dealing with kid, a child after the fact, 
um, who's been appointed and says, you know, I've got one sibling who's who's doing something ridiculous with mom and dad's money, wants to list this house, and you know, mom might be able to return there. I'd like to give her some time to figure that out. And they're completely on different pages. So if we have multiples, I want you to think, are we setting them up for success? Are we setting you up for success, right? If they're not going to agree on anything, we should think about whether it should be one instead and an alternate as a backup, or maybe even using a professional if it's hard for your family to come to terms with some of these things. So there are some powers that you can grant to them. Do you want them to be able to transfer your money to themselves? That's a scary power, right? There's a, you hear a lot on the news about senior scams and financial exploitation. So again, we really wanna vet and be careful about who we appoint and whether we grant them the power to transfer your money to their name, okay? So there are other versions of powers of attorney and some attorneys will make sure, in my office, I make sure my clients have the statutory version because it's easy to recognize in, in Minnesota. But I also usually supplement it with what's called a general power of attorney. And this general durable power of attorney, the reason I do that is there are some powers that the state of Minnesota was reluctant to give the people you've appointed. They're nervous because they want to protect you, right? They don't want somebody to run away with the entirety of your funds. But we want to think and pay attention to are we going to try any planning strategies to preserve your assets if you need care? And if so, does the document that you have allow or enable us to do that? So if, they, if an attorney is walking you through multiple versions of a power of attorney, it might be because the statutory power has some limitations built into it. So what happens if you don't have a power of attorney? There's no insurance that financial transactions can be handled on your behalf or that the entirety of them can be handled on your behalf. And I found that there's greater risk for fraud and exploitation with the people who come to, into our office. Sometimes people are having signs of memory loss and that's happening through and you can see it first in financial transactions or decision making. And if we have a power of attorney who can help and come in or look at statements, oversee, help them organize, make calls, work with their care team, financial providers, professionals, that team that we're building around you, that can be really beneficial and help reduce the risk of, of people taking advantage of you from the outside. And again, if you don't have this document and we don't have the authority to handle financial transactions, then we might end up back in a court setting. And guardianship is all about care for a person, personal well-being, medical decisions. Conservatorship is care of a person's assets. Who has the legal authority to care? And if you don't have a power of attorney, we might, again, wind up before a judge petitioning the court incurring that time and expense because we, don't, we haven't done other planning strategies, okay? So I'm going to go over this estate planning part relatively fast because I wanna be sure we have time for some other topics and questions, but often people have um, some confusion about what happens when we die with our assets and what the purpose of standard estate planning is, like wills and trusts. And those documents are really there to designate where assets go upon your death and who has the authority to carry out your, the charges that you've set forth. So if you've said in your document, I want everything to go equally to my kids, who's going to actually cut those checks from your estate? So it's really important to know that how your assets are titled or beneficiary designated is more important than what a will or a trust says. Can you believe that? So if you have a joint account, so it's owned jointly, you and I have a joint account and it has rights of survivorship. If I die, the entirety will pass to you. Even if I said, you know, if I die, I'd really like that asset to go over here. 
It doesn't matter because I've made you a joint owner, okay? Now, beneficiary designations also have that same power. So if I have a retirement account that's in my name and I've left it equally to my children, 50-50, that's going to pass to them even if my will says I want to leave it to my sister, okay? So your beneficiary designations and your ownership on accounts need to coordinate with whatever documents you're putting together. So it's important. Sometimes my clients are like, Brenna, why are you asking me so many questions about my accounts and the title of them and beneficiaries? And I remind you that it's really important that we look at this not only in completing a document, but on a whole picture, are we working towards your goals? Are we all on the same page? And do our accounts properly reflect that? So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, wills and trusts. You'll notice I'm kind of speeding through some things, so bear with me. But wills are there to really say where your assets go when you're dead. They have no bearing on how you live, right, while you're alive. These are documents that spring into effect only after you've died. They're relatively easy to establish, and they give you some simplicity, right? You can change your mind during your lifetime with not a lot of hassle. You can update a beneficiary and not necessarily update your will. But it does provide us with certainty for your survivors. It shows us where that the resources go. But the bad side to a will is that generally when you die and your assets pass through your estate, we need a probate administration or a court proceeding to transfer ownership of accounts to the survivors that you named in your document. And that brings some loss of privacy and some expense. And so some people want to avoid that through trust planning. And I think trusts are one of the most confusing areas of the law. People constantly tell me, you know, Brenna, um, Susie Orman told me I need a trust, so I'm in here because whatever Susie says, I follow. <laughs> and I'm like, Susie, when I meet you one day. <laughs> so I, what you need to know is not everyone needs a trust to plan, okay? Trust sometimes can be um, difficult, more difficult to establish and maintain or manage. But the good thing is that they do maintain privacy after you die and they can avoid um, a more complicated estate proceeding. And the nice thing about trust is sometimes it also provides for this planning for incapacity. Like a power of attorney, it can say, if I'm incapacitated, who can manage my trust or assets, right? The successor trustee that you've named can. So it, it helps not only sometimes from a what happens when you die, but how to plan well from, for while you're alive. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, bring you back to, well, what happens when I'm incapacitated or need care in some way, right? I'm not dead, but I need to plan for, for care needs. And I talk about my clients entering a care continuum, right? It seems really daunting and overwhelming because we can look at many different factors when it comes to long-term care. One is, what your, your current health status is like. Do we have some functional limitations, physically or cognitively? What are our wishes regarding where we receive care? How many of you would say, you know, I wanna leave home feet first? Any, no? Okay, some of you wanna stay at home for as long as you can, and some people are like, you know, if I have to move, that's okay by me. So we want to talk about what the ideal care setting for you and your loved ones are. And it might not be the same, and you might have an opinion on it now, but if your condition changes, you might not be able to carry that out anymore because functional limitations have increased. And what is this cost of care, right? What does it, if we need to look at care outside of our immediate family, or informal caregivers and supports, what will that cost us? And what resources are available to help us fund it? 
So often I look at this and you can get lost pretty quickly in the care continuum and the long-term care maze. We want to try and piece it together and really get at the heart of, of your values and, and needs. So I have a disclaimer because, again, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. We do that, right? <laughs> so one, there are a couple of things you should know. And one is when you're planning for long-term care, you should really seek advice from a competent elder law attorney because we look at things like what are your assets, what are your care needs, and what are your support systems in place and what benefits you could be entitled to. We're not just looking at the legal documents, but that broader picture. And that's really important because when it comes to payment or paying for long-term care, we're going to need to know all of that background to make a good decision. And again, back to that planning early thing, right? We might have more options if we start incorporating plans now than waiting until later. So there are a few constants or questions that my clients ask me. And let me tell you, I, I made these these questions more complex than what my clients say to me, right? So how do you access great care, right? How do we make sure that our quality of life stays high even as we get older or our prognosis changes? So how do we have the best quality of life and access to care during that time? That's question number one. Question number two is how do we get the the help we need to fund that care? And how do we know what benefit provides what service? Does this, is this covered by Medicare? Do we need Medicaid? Are there veterans benefits that we can access? And how do we protect the maximum amount of resources so our loved ones are, we have what we need from a care perspective, but our loved ones also have financial security. So there are multiple resources to help pay for care, but I do have to say that in general, the primary place that we fund care in this country, if somebody has a long-term care need, is through private resources, okay? And that's something that um, is challenging and maybe it will change in the future, but it, our current landscape is, if we have a chronic care need, it's likely coming out of our own pockets first before it's coming from other, any other source. So there's also, um, some people have paid in privately to long-term care insurance. And I think that if, if people have, we're also looking at that as an option. And how do we access benefits? Because some people, I recently worked with a client who had gone through many hoops with the insurer and still hadn't received payment under the policy a year after care began. So, right, we've got to make sure that there's some advocacy and resources to navigate. How do we actually get that benefit? We've paid in, now how do we take out? Okay. Medicare can cover some cares. Typically, it's temporary. What I want you to know about Medicare is that Medicare, like standard insurance, its goal is to fix you or get you well and then get you back um, home or back off um, a long-term care need. So Medicare covers typically hospitalization. It covers short-term rehabilitation under certain circumstances. So Medicare is really there to cover your, your medical providers or hospitalization and get you back on your feet. But if you have a long-term need, it's not going to pay for maybe what we typically think as home care or assisted living, memory care, nursing home. And then for people who are veterans, there are also veterans benefits that can pay to veterans and spouses of veterans in some circumstances to help fund chronic care needs. So I have information in your, um, 
I want to get a gauge. I've seen multiple questions go, but we're we're approaching the end of my time before the Q&A. So I want you to know that before we kind of, I wrap up this portion, we can go back to some in-depth questions if, if there's time on the back end, but medical assistance is a program, it's sometimes referred to as Medicaid, right? Medicaid's a federal umbrella. The state of Minnesota administers a program called medical assistance. And medical assistance is a resource that as long as you're a Minnesota resident, are over age 65 or have a disability, um, can help cover long-term care costs if you meet financial eligibility thresholds. And if you're a single individual, that's just, you would have to have only $3,000 of available assets. That means things in your checking account, retirement account, um, cash surrender value on life insurance. If you are married, the spouse that needs the care would be at $3,000, but the spouse who doesn't can keep up to $126,420, okay? So uh, I heard some chuckles. So people, that makes, that, those numbers make some people nervous, nervous laughter maybe. Um, but it, that's the financial eligibility threshold. There are some assets that don't count towards that, like your homestead or um, a vehicle, pre-funded funerals, personal effects. Uh, sometimes my clients say, well, Brenna, if I buy a bunch of gold bars, is that personal property, right, and not cash? Um, there's lots of ways to get creative, but that's not one of them. <laughs> so what you need to know is that we, there are planning strategies if we want to plan for potential eligibility or need down the road that we can employ. And there's more information in your um, packet there about the eligibility rules. So I'm gonna touch on a look back period because I get a lot of questions from clients or prospective clients about what, is it, what does a look back period mean anyways? I heard that there's a seven year or a three year look back on um, asset transfers. Well, what you need to know is that if you've made gifts, right? If you've transferred assets from your name to someone else and you didn't receive anything back, right? It's not, um, I bought something for you from you and I got something and you got cash, right? It's not a one to one. You've given something for nothing in return. If that's the case, we need to know about that because any time you transfer assets, we need to report it if those transfers have happened within 60 months or five years from when we've applied. And any gifts that you've made can be penalized, which means that they don't come after, sometimes people ask me, do they go after your house? Do they, if, if we don't qualify, do they go after your assets? No, what they say is, sorry, you're not eligible. That means you have to find a way privately to fund or pay for this. So we need to know if there's been gifting that's happened, how much, and we need to plan for that look back window. But you should know that if you're married, transfers from spouses don't, aren't negatively, Im they don't have any negative impact, right? So a husband and wife or a wife and wife, husband and husband can transfer assets back and forth without any issue. What I tell people is that medical assistance can giveth, but it also can taketh away, okay? <laughs> That's the estate recovery portion. And what that means is that Medical assistance is there as a resource to help fund care while you're alive. But it went after you die, they would like to try and recoup whatever benefits they've paid out for you. This is called estate recovery, okay? So if you tell me in one sentence, I really wanna preserve assets for my kids, and in the second sentence, 
um, you say, but let's get on medical assistance as soon as possible, right? We've got a plan for what the primary goal is. Do we protect assets for you while you're alive? Do we plan for future generations or leaving a legacy to your children or grandchildren? Um, again, if we plan early for these things, we have the most options available or strategies available to us. So, I did include some information for veterans and their spouses in this, in this seminar. So I'm going to go through it right now. How many of you are veterans or spouses of veterans? I've got some. Oh, wow, good portion. So what I want you to know is that in addition to medical assistance, we also have two different programs that can help fund care and that's the Minnesota Veterans Home, as well as a federal program called Aid in Attendance or Non-Service Connected Pension. And these programs are resources to help finance care. But I know that the puzzle can be overwhelming and it's probably all turning into um, a, a, a brain full of mush right now at this point. So. I want to wrap up by just telling you, let's, let's really build a team around you and build what we call a life care plan in my office. So in my office, we talk about building a plan for care needs or management of chronic conditions through not only identifying or establishing essential legal documents, but also ensuring that you have all the care resources and payor resources available to you. Um, we want to be sure that you have advocates, like uh, an elder law attorney, a social worker, um, your care team around you working towards the same goal. So who should be on your team, right? How do you start assembling your life care planning team? You should get an elder law attorney. And we work at our office, we have a full-time social worker on staff too. So that's, um, we do that because there are so many questions regarding quality of care and um, providers and making sure we know if you're looking at one memory care provider, is it the same? Are we really comparing apples to apples or are we comparing apples to oranges? How do we know what level of care is being provided? And our social worker helps navigate that. And another social worker in your, in your um, family or in your circle could also do that. We also work with public benefit specialists, um, veteran service offices. We're accredited with the VA. Um, we have a full-time case manager, two actually, who handle applications for benefits. So that can help you so you don't have to try and figure out, am I submitting what's necessary? Is this going to get approved once I submit it? You have somebody kind of pushing you along the way to say, here's how we're gonna line this up. And then we want to start building kind of who in your family circle or your loved ones are the people you want a part of your, your team and decision making. Do we start bringing them to the table now? How do we have the talk with them? And how do we make sure that we're all working together? I look at um, financial advisors or planners and accountants too. So I tell people, start identifying, write down, use this kind of as a list and start IDing. Do you have these people in your circle? Can we start assembling them and do you really trust them? Do you want them to be part of this decision making? If so, let's work together and develop a plan together. Um, I also encourage all of my clients to have the support they need. So that can come from a caregiver support group, it can come from a therapist, it can come from an end of life doula. These are relatively new and um, they're a wonderful resource. I'm getting certified in this right now as well because um, we need more tools about how to navigate end of life from an emotional, psychological, familial, financial, and legal perspective, right? And then Medicare insurance specialists or funeral planners, we want to be sure that we've thought through who you love, who you count on, and how do we make sure it's clear what our wishes are. So even if you can't carry them out, someone can carry them out on your behalf. So 
What are your action steps today? So we've covered a lot of ground. Think through a little bit about your values and what you want your legacy to be. What your wishes are about care or treatment and start um, thinking, but don't stop at the thinking stage, right? There's pre-contemplation, there's contemplation, then we move into action, right? I don't want you to stop at the first step, okay? We gotta make sure we do more than that. Um, then I want you to think through, and you can use my list to identify your team players. Meet with an elder law attorney. Execute or review your documents, and not only do documents, but talk about the uncomfortable plan for the worst, right, so we can live your best. Have the talk, revisit it, and review on an annual basis. I think about this plan. I, we do a plan with our clients, but it doesn't stop with signing a document, right, or establishing this plan. We've got to make sure we have a process for reviewing it regularly to make sure that that plan still makes sense. Or if the roadmap didn't go as planned, as it often does not go as planned, we want to be sure that there's other alternatives or stops along the way. So I'm going to make sure that we have some time to cover questions. That's good because we have about 45 questions. Oh, great, great. <laughs> so come on, rapid fire. <laughs> All right, here we go, Brenna. All right. I'm going to curate them a little bit. So, sure. can you recommend a healthcare directive form in particular where you would find it? Similarly, where would we find the five wishes document if that's the one we want to use sure. for free? Okay. So, five wishes is a difficult one to get your hands on for free. If you look for it online, you're mostly going to find that they're about five five dollars. I think it's cheaper if you buy in bulk. So if you're a part of a support group, go in together, right, <laughs> and get it down to that cheaper mark. But um, I would say that one of my favorite forms to utilize is the Honoring Choices long form. And that's available for free online. It goes through a lot of questions regarding your values and wishes. And it also clearly identifies an agent. Okay, I want, I, I like that document. We also at our office have our own, our own form as most attorneys do. Mm -hmm. Got a couple of them with some family dynamics. Oh yeah. As you can imagine. Uh, yeah, definitely. So this one's talking about the differences between healthcare directives and posts. Right. Right, so siblings agree with what's in the healthcare directive, but they can't agree on the post specifically CPR and what we know about the outcomes with older adults, this particular person, 89 years old. Right. Um, so their concern is that with the pulse as it currently is, it's a full code, so they would have CPR. So they're kind of asking about why isn't a healthcare directive as enforceable as a yeah. pulse? Lots of right. differences between forms. Right, so the unfortunate thing is that um, Attorneys and, med and doctors apparently couldn't get it together, right? <laughs> they, they couldn't figure out or prove that one document was, was good enough for all. So now we have two documents that could conflict, right? So what you should know is because the post is a doctor's order, that, that really trumps what your directive says, okay? So you do need both though, because a pulse does not have a legal agent appointed. So we have no person who can navigate or speak on your behalf. What I tell people is that, again, if you have a healthcare directive, even if you're incapacitated, your agent that you've named can do a pulse with your provider and make sure it follows your wishes and make sure that they're uniform so I guess from a family dynamic perspective, it's important to look through and say, is the individual incapacitated or can they speak for themselves right now? If they can't speak for themselves, who is the agent? And that agent is the only one who should be directing and corresponding with the doctor about code statuses and the post, okay? So legally, that's kind of how they, they work together and separately. Family dynamics again here. Mm -hmm. So if prior to an onset of memory loss, mm -hmm. there was a power of attorney, an advanced directive completed yeah. to extend life, then child number two 
has one completed that does not extend life. Mm -hmm. Then child number three, well, that's a post then, has a post completed. Mm -hmm. Then child number three does not extend life. Is the post going to trump everything? How does it affect when something is changed when there's memory loss involved? Right. This is very, this is a confusing question because it's it a confusing is. scenario. <laughs> right, it is. And we hear about this a lot, um, you know, unfortunately. So we have the planning side of our practice, but we also have four full-time attorneys who do what's called contested elder law, which is the contested guardianship, conservatorship, and estate issues. Because there are lots of family dynamics, and the reality is stress brings out um, unbelievable things that we can't anticipate or expect, right? People react to trauma in different ways. So what's important to remember is that your directive, if you did one directive and you had the capacity to do it, and you've designated an agent, that agent, again, can go through a pulse. The pulse can be changed, but if you've designated all three children as agents with the ability to act independently, the reality is you are going to run into this scenario that each one of them could have a different opinion and could get a doctor to sign a, a different pulse or document later. So I want you to think long and hard on the front end about designating an agent. If you're in that scenario and you don't know what to do, sometimes guardianship is the, is the process that can help, even though it's, um, I know it's uh, onerous to go through. A guardianship can provide clarity because there will be a court order on these issues and legally only one person can make those decisions. Would you suggest having only one child as a point person or divvying up responsibilities? That's a great question. And again, it goes back to my comment, where do people have time, talents, and treasures, right? So sometimes somebody who is a great care provider is not a good fiscal manager, right? Or financial manager. Sometimes it is the same person for every role. So we're going to spend, you know, when we do planning, we talk a lot about what is the role we're asking them to do? Do they have the ability to do it? If they, if they don't personally have the ability but know how to contract with the right resources or utilize them, do we still want them in charge? Um, we can run into some difficulty. Sometimes I have had a providers where um, or a situation where one child felt like it was time for mom to move into care, and they're the healthcare agent and can make those decisions, but then the other child who handled the finances said, oh no, we're not paying for that, right? So what I would caution is don't pick too, someone too cheap. <laughs> you know, no, I'm joking. <laughs> No, but be careful, you know, <laughs> when you are naming these people because they're the people who are going to carry this out. And their personal impact will, you know, their personal opinions will rub off on you whether you wanted them to or not. Go ahead. Can a person be appointed an agent without knowing it? Or do you have to be notified? Yeah. So in Minnesota, we do not, listen to that, Minnesota. <laughs> um, I grew up in Wisconsin for the record. <laughs> so in Minnesota, you do have, um, you can appoint a, an agent without notifying them, okay? So often people sign these directives and never tell their, their loved one, friend, neighbor, child, that they're this person. And I have had it come up where had the individual asked, this person would have told them, I'm not the right person for the job. I recently was talking with a family and she said, you know, my brother was named as the agent and he definitely didn't like it, he didn't want it, and he would have told mom that. But we, we didn't get that opportunity and by the time we found the document, she couldn't update, right? So sometimes we're dealt the cards we're given, right? If, there, if the agent doesn't want that job, they can resign, but we have to think about who's the next person in line, right? It, does the document provide for a successor, or do we need to, um, again, go through guardianship to get someone else appointed? 
Can one person be a healthcare agent for many people or is there a limit? No limit. So, but tell, let me tell you, you don't want that job. <laughs> So um, I think that it is important to know that you can serve for multiple people. It's a large job and depending on the situation, you might be needed more in some settings than others. But um, in a, in a, for example, my family, I'm my husband's agent, I'm my parents' agent. You know, um, if something happened to all three of them at once, I'm SOL. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. How would you go around or go about finding someone to designate as a healthcare agent if you don't have anyone to ask? Are there professional yeah. healthcare agents or any nonprofits or anyone that you can right. hire? So there are professional fiduciaries and there are professional agents. Typically, if you have, um, if you don't have a loved one that you can ask or any or somebody that you feel confident can do the job. Maybe you do have a support system there, but you don't want them to serve in this role in particular. There are professional organizations, and a lot of the fiduciaries that act or have the professional companies that do this do want compensation for serving, right? They exist because they get paid to do the, the work, and generally that work's done on an hourly basis. Um, there are some nonprofits who are acting as agents now, including Lutheran Social Services. So Lutheran Social Services does have a program. You have to pay a small upfront fee, but they will meet with you. They'll walk through your directive. They'll make sure that they have a sense, and they'll note their file and build a file. I would say that it's very important that your providers and your inner circle knows that you've appointed a professional because often it does matter who shows up, right? They, uh, who shows up has a lot of power sometimes, even though legally they're not entitled to a lot of power. They do have some, some authority by just being there and directing providers in a crisis. So you want to be sure that if you appoint a professional, that everyone has the copies they need of that document. Speaking of documents, do we have to use a certain healthcare directive form or can it be my own and I just get it notarized? Or you hear of people having a DNR tattooed over their heart? <laughs> yes, the DNR tattoo. Ooh, <laughs> does that count? <laughs> um, so a DNR tattoo, I don't think that they would, um, you know, most medical professionals are going to follow that if you don't have a post or a healthcare directive in place because um, it does give them some guidance, right? But they might get confused. Does that stand for someone's initials? Is that the Department of Natural Resources? What do we mean, right? <laughs> so what I want you to do is you do need a document in place, right? The tattoos or the medical bracelets aren't enough. You need to have that document, but the format or the form you pick is personal to you. It doesn't have to take any specific one is not better than the other as long as it's done. I do tell people, I caution people a little bit about DIY legal documents, right? Do-it-yourself legal documents that you've said, you know, I like this part and I'm just going to consolidate this into one. I'm going to take the parts I like of each form and put it all together in a Word document and sign it and notarize it. My concern is you're going to leave out a provision that you didn't know you needed, right? So if you're going to do that or if you want to do that, work with a professional to make sure you're not unintentionally omitting something you need. Is the power of attorney a different person than the agent or are they the same? Powers of attorney have are a document and they appoint an attorney in fact to handle finances. So an attorney in fact is the person who makes financial decisions. An agent is a person who makes medical decisions. They can be the same person, but it's two different documents or forms. Is a power of attorney document a public document or why is not having a power of attorney a greater risk of fraud and exploitation? Yeah, so a power of attorney is not a public document. It's something that most people keep, you know, tucked away until it's needed, and then their attorney, in fact, accesses it to start utilizing it. Um, what I, what, when I say it, you're at less risk of fraud is that 
often people who have appointed a power of attorney and has, have had the talk with them and who have incorporated them into their planning team, that person starts helping by looking through, accessing statements, getting involved earlier than waiting until we find out there's been um, big cases of fraud or exploitation. Somebody's come over, they've said that they're going to trim trees five times now, right? And you're left with a twig. You didn't even have a tree. So I think that it's important to know that we can utilize um, agents to help us or powers of attorney to help us earlier than when you're completely unable to, to understand what's happening from a financial perspective. I encourage people to bring them into the fold before a crisis. If you move to a different state, is the power of attorney still good in that state? And I'm gonna extend that to healthcare directives and pull these documents. Right. Yeah. Is it good in any state or do you have to redo it? So I would say when you move, it's important to have an attorney in that state review what you've done previously because each state, we have federal law, but we also have 50 states all, um, all navigating their own laws regarding these issues. And some states have different requirements. So um, for example, in Wisconsin, there's a notice requirement or a disclaimer that people have to sign off on. That's different than, their, than Minnesota. So we wanna be sure that whatever we've established is recognized because part of this is not just going through the process, it's making sure that the documents you've established are user friendly. They can actually work, right? So it's important we, that we work with an attorney in the state that you've moved to just to review to make sure whether or not there needs to be any changes. How is power of attorney activated? How can we go about activating power of attorney if the loved one can no longer live in their home? Yeah, that's a hard question. So generally in a statutory power of attorney that I showed you the picture of from the state of Minnesota, that is valid when you sign it. So if I gave um, you know, Jim power of attorney, Jim's my power of attorney, congratulations. <laughs> So if I signed that document today, Jim could start writing checks on my behalf today. And I'm up and running, right? So I, there's two of me now. There's Jim and there's Brenna, and we both have authority, right? So it's not a, what we call a springing document. It doesn't just spring into effect when we're incapacitated. Most powers of attorney are valid when it's signed. And this makes some people really uncomfortable. They're like, well, I don't want, you know, if I'm upright right now, I don't want Jim going to the bank for me, right? I can do that myself. The reason this is, um, is because it's very difficult for a financial institution to interpret capacity, right? How is a bank or a bank teller going to know whether or not someone has capacity? They're not in the business of assessing capacity. They're not medical providers. A financial institution just needs to be able to look at a document and know, does this person have the power to sign for what they're asking to do? So most powers of attorney are what I call live documents. You know, they're, they're valid when it's signed. So if you wanna start using them, the attorney in fact, or the person named, brings it to a financial institution or writes a check. Now please never forge someone else's signature, okay? So if Jim is signing for me, he shouldn't be signing Brenna Gelvin, right? Jim should be signing um, Brenna Gelvin by Jim, her power of attorney, right? We need to be sure that we're not just forging signatures, we're actually acknowledging what is our role and that we have legal power. Speaking of banks, some banks require additional paperwork besides power of attorney, which can cause delays and complications. They don't necessarily inform you of that until you need to make a transaction. Why isn't the power of attorney enough? Yeah. Cough, cough, Wells Fargo, cough, cough, right? So <laughs> this is actually a different bank. Than oh, Wells it's a Fargo. different one. Merrill Shoot. Lynch. Shoot. It's spreading, yeah. <laughs> so I can tell you that large financial institutions tend to like their own paperwork. Why? 
Why do they make it hard for all of us? But the reason is because these large institutions like Merrill Lynch, Charles Schwab, um, Morgan Stanley, Vanguard, you know, these institutions, Wells Fargo, they serve not only the state of Minnesota, right? They serve the entire country and each state has its own form, right? There's not a universal power of attorney in all 50 states. So as a result, they often will eventually accept your form, but their legal department needs to review it. And that can take time and delays and sometimes advocacy. So the nice thing about that statutory form that I showed you the picture of is that in Minnesota, if they're doing business in Minnesota, they are presented with a statutory power of attorney and they don't accept it and we have to get involved to making them accept it and that causes any cost or um, time, they could be held liable for damages. <laughs> so I like having that document because I get to threaten people, right? I say, you know, buddy, if you don't take this, you know, we're gonna send the bill to you for not accepting it. It doesn't always, um, unfortunately, because of these large compliance departments, we have a lot of, um, we have to navigate through, through those waters and those different legal departments. Do attorneys have a sense or no competency before they allow a client to sign? So this is the most layer answer I'll give you today. It depends, right? <laughs> so capacity is different depending on what we are, the legal standards for capacity are not the same for all documents. The capacity threshold for a healthcare directive is lower than a power of attorney, is lower than a will, okay? So we talk with our clients a lot about what we're looking or needing them to sign, and then we're making sure that they have the right capacity for that document. So we do, it's hard because, right, lawyers aren't trained as medical providers. We're not, we don't have that background, but we do know the legal standard or necessity, and then we go through to make sure our clients meet that standard. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the activation of POA. How does a healthcare agent get activated? Those generally, you can have a healthcare directive set up two ways in Minnesota. One is immediate, so it doesn't spring into power later. It's immediately valid. The other is a springing power, and that's more common. That's when you're incapacitated, and it's incapacity defined by your medical provider. So if a medical provider is saying, you know, we, we don't think your loved one can make this decision, so we're looking at you as the agent. They're, they're the ones initiating the document or your authority to act. Back to the post here. So a comment, the post is so important. Make sure you have copies and take it everywhere with you. The skilled nursing facility, assisted living everywhere, uses this to assure the residents' wishes are carried out. It's your voice in the time when you have no voice. Mm -hmm. Again, Polst, this comment is, but it's not always where mom is. How do we make it maximally accessible? Do we bring it somewhere so that the police or EMTs can honor it? Yeah, so in the eight county metro area, all emergency responders are trained to look at your fridge. And my clients are like, Brenna, I have pictures of my grandkids there. I don't want pictures, you know, my pulsed or my um, do not resuscitate order staring me in the face every day. But that's where they're trained to look. So hang it there for sure. Make copies of these documents and you should carry them. We want to be sure that they're scanned into your electronic medical record with your providers. So your primary care physician, any specialists have a copy as well and your loved ones, so your agent has a copy of these documents. Um, some people do carry around um, or with them kind of a file at all times, but I can tell you that if you're in an accident, they don't check, they don't check through your personal effects to make these calls or decisions. So, um, but they do check your, your fridge if it happens at home or if you're in an assisted living, memory care facility, or skilled nursing home. These code documents tend to be on the door. 
If you've already had an advanced directive written, what's the best way to update it or change the wishes when you've already distributed copies to your healthcare providers and your family? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard part about, you know, once you distribute documents and now you want to make changes, it is good practice to make sure you note where you made, where you distributed those copies, right? So when you update, you can go back to those individuals or organizations and provide them with a new document. That's especially important if you have people who you've appointed one agent in one document and then you've updated the agent in the other document. So generally, you just re-sign or sign a new directive and that directive does revoke the former. Okay, but we want to be sure they're also notified they've been given the boot. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of the boot, can a person with memory loss's healthcare directive be changed or overwritten by their healthcare agent? Or, and how do we as professionals advocate for their initial requests if there is a contradiction? Yeah, this is hard because your agent has a lot of power, including the power to um, supersede whatever, whatever you've written in it. So that's why I say that the agent, appointing the right agent, is the most important thing you can do because they have the authority to respond. And it's a good authority in some cases, so the reasoning behind it is when you draft your directive, you might not know or have thought of every iteration of the what happens if, right? You're thinking more in broad context. So we want an agent to respond to whatever's happening in the moment. The difficulty is that agent might, um, in that moment, have a difference of opinion than you would have had, okay? So it is something that, as a provider, if you're working with a family, I think it's really critical that we have these hard conversations with families to say, you know, we've had an initial conversation about the person's wants and wishes. They've been notified of that. And then as conditions change or care needs change, we sit down with family members again and reiterate, you know, the directive has said this is their wish. This is your mom's wish. And your job is really to, to fulfill that. But if they say no, she would not have wanted this, or I want to keep going, the agent has the authority to do that. What is the correct term for the form when we're deciding CPR, DNR? Is it on the advanced directive and it's also on the POLST? How are they different? Yeah, the POLST is the document that is the medical order on those issues. Your healthcare directive can also communicate to your agent your preferences about it. So generally, if you do pre-planning and you're not, you've created your healthcare directive, you're not terminally ill, you're not medically fragile, you're just doing a directive. You don't, I don't have a pulse personally because if something happens, I don't wanna have a universal do not resuscitate, do not intubate order right now at this point in my life, okay? So I've given some indication about my wishes related to if, any of these conditions happen, here's generally what I'd want. Okay, so that's all found in my healthcare directive. The POLST is, can be initiated by not only the patient and the doctor, but also an agent, a healthcare agent at a later date. So they're, they work together. They are independent documents, but they should support each other. On the POLST itself, the A section is self-explanatory, mm -hmm. according to this writer. Um, <laughs> so I think that's the DNR section. Mm -hmm. Can you explain more in terms of the second section where it's talking about, um, yes, goals of treatment, choosing those, you know, if you've had a stroke or a heart attack and you have a pulse but you're, and you're breathing, you know, kind of those get into comfort care interventions. Can you explain that a little more? So the next section is related to if, if you were um, or do you want to have a blanket, I do not want to any sort of treatment. So this is a blanket palliative care or hospice designation. I do not want any treatment for any illness. I just want um, to be kept as pain-free and comfortable as possible. Or I would want 
um, some treatment or I want to try everything. Okay, so this section is really related to your goals for overall um, treatment when you are, I guess, immediately, because the post is valid right away, right? So not just at end of life, but immediately upon signing. I would say that the best person to guide you through the post is not your lawyer, right? This is a doctor's order. And your Medicare coverage does cover, I don't know if you remember um, the media say, talking about death panels, right? A few, a few years ago when the Affordable Care Act came out, you know, there was all this um, blowback about what are death panels and um, why does Medicare cover them? The reason that that was there is because now Medicare does cover uh, meeting with a, a healthcare, your healthcare provider to talk about end of life wishes and planning. And you can you call your provider and say, I want to have a meeting to discuss end of life care and I want that, you know, my, my one Medicare meeting about that to be covered and they'll walk through this with you. And I should say that you're, I'm not the best person to explain the contents of what is intubation or resuscitation, right? I didn't go to med school, I went to law school. <laughs> so I want you to go to the right person for that advice. Mm -hmm. In terms of a revocable trust, can you give an example of why a trust would have to go through probate? And is there a financial minimum estate amount that can avoid going through probate? Yeah, okay. The dreaded P, right? Probate, what is it? Um, so probate is generally, it is the legal process that we transfer assets that are in your name alone to either your heirs or the people you've named in a will, okay? So if I die with assets in my name alone, no joint ownership, no beneficiary, but I have a will or I have legal heirs that survive me, probates the process to transfer ownership from my name to them, okay? If the asset is under $75,000 in value, so if there's only one account, it's my checking account, it's got $10,000 in it, it's in my name alone with no beneficiary, we are not going to have to go through probate to collect it, okay? Now, people sometimes think us establishing a trust is going to always avoid probate. But I think of a trust, I'm a visual learner, so I think of a trust as a glass. Do you all have cups or glasses of water around you that you can look at? So a cup, right, is, it's an entity. It's an inanimate object, right? A trust is kind of like this cup. In order for it to work, we have to pour our assets or title our accounts into the trust. So now I've got my house in the name of the Brenna Gelvin Trust. I've got my bank account in the name of the Brenna Gelvin Trust. I've got my investment account there. So I no longer own those as individuals. This entity that doesn't die, right? It might get banged up, but it doesn't die, is the owner. So we get to avoid probate because this lives even if I'm no longer here. Okay. So if you have not retitled your assets into your trust, your trust is not going to work in the way it was intended. So trust planning requires a lot of diligence to make sure your assets are titled and functioning properly. Okay. One final question, and I'm sorry, we didn't get it to about 10 questions, <laughs> but last question. A scenario, if there's an adult child living in the home, mm -hmm. caring for a parent, and then the parent needs to move into long-term care, how does that affect medical assistance eligibility if the adult child is continuing to live in the home? Yeah, this is hard. I've, I've worked with a lot of families in similar contexts. So there is, um, I talked to you really briefly about what we call the transfer rules. You know, if you, we transfer ownership or assets title, to someone, um, there are some exceptions to those rules and one would be um, an exception to a caregiver, a child, grandchild who's lived in the home for the two years preceding your entrance into care. You're not penalized for transferring ownership. You should not do that unless you're working with an attorney to make sure you actually qualify for that exception, okay? So you don't wanna do something and have a negative impact. but. 
if I've worked with a lot of families because they are worried. Um, recently, I had a client who had been caregiving for their mother, quit their job, moved into the house with them to provide the care that she needed for her to stay at home for as long as possible. But at a certain point, she was unable to do so. So she moved into a care setting. And even though he had done it for two years, there was a reverse mortgage on the property, right? So there wasn't, we didn't have the ability to transfer ownership. The house did have to be sold. So there's a lot of factors that can play in. One would be your financial situation, whether or not we're looking at medical assistance. Are, is there, what's the title or ownership of the property? Are there any um, encumbrances like mortgages or um, home equity lines of credit or reverse mortgages that could impact our ability to, to handle that asset. So work with someone who knows how to navigate these rules and they'll make sure that we're not doing anything to violate uh, or put you into jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks everyone.